morning. morning. Blessed Sabbath to everyone here. Um, please just kneel with me one more time as I ask the Lord to be with us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we continue to have to worship you in relative peace and safety. We now invite your presence to be with here. Give me the words that you've given to speak today. Imbue us with your Holy Spirit. Surround us with your guardian angels. And keep us with your presence. We continue to ask you, Lord, to be with us in all things as we study your word today. Open our minds to the truth. And open our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, today's message is going to be a Bible study. Uh, we are going to be looking up many passages of Scripture which will clearly reveal the truth on this important topic, which can be confusing to some people. I've never spoken on this topic before, but I do feel, feel led by the Holy Spirit to shed some light on this, especially in view of the many false doctrines and, that are being promoted all over the internet. Um, the internet these days can be a very dangerous place because the devil also has his videos there deceiving many people right and left. So I believe that this is a timely message to give today. Um, we're going to examine the word angels and how it is used in the Bible, and in the process, we are also going to unveil the identity of a mysterious being that is mentioned at least five times in Scripture. Some may be surprised to learn that he appears in many other places in the Bible as well, but first let's again look at our Scripture text. And there is... How many? One God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And beloved, this scripture text is very important to our study today, and we're going to come back later and revisit this text to show you why it's so important. We know that there are professed Christians that are promoting another mediator besides Jesus Christ. And there's even a prominent religion today that promotes their own church leader as another mediator that also has the ability to even forgive your sins. But friends, this is not biblical. There's only one mediator between God and man in the Bible, and that is Christ Jesus. And we're going to come back to this later. Now, um, before we begin our Bible study today, some of you may remember the six steps on how to study the Bible that I gave in another sermon recently. So there are no shortcuts when it comes to the study of the scriptures. You must follow all six steps in order to arrive at the truth. If you attempt to skip some of the steps or overlook some of the steps, any one of the steps, then what happens is you open the door for Satan to come in and to suggest interpretations of Scripture that are false. I cannot stress this enough because the Bible is unlike any other book that you'll ever read or study. It uses symbols, it uses metaphors, it uses analogies, it uses symbolic narratives, and it uses allegories or parables. So it is a spiritual book with both a literal and a spiritual application to our lives. And if you attempt to read the Bible as simply a literal book, there is a 100% chance that you are going to misinterpret the scriptures. You will misinterpret the scriptures. You will still be searching around for the beast with seven heads and ten horns, and I promise you, you'll never find it. <laughs> Friends, you know, we face a formidable foe, and without the power of God working in our lives through the Holy Spirit, we don't stand a chance. We're toast. And today, there are professed Christians that believe in evolution, 
Others believe that the earth is flat. Some believe that God has done away with the Ten Commandments, which of course means now that we can lie, steal, and commit adultery if he did. While others still believe that we only have to keep nine commandments to be saved, even though James 2.10 tells us that they all stand and fall as one. And there's some that even promote that angels are intermarrying with men and producing Nephilim, but Matthew 22.30 and Mark 12.25 clearly refute this idea. So the angels neither marry or, but as of the God, as God in heaven, the angels of God in heaven, they don't marry. But all this is proof positive that Satan has lost none of his powers to deceive since he was cast out of heaven. So he's working harder today than he has ever worked because he knows that his time is short and it's only through the power of Jesus Christ that we can be shielded from his many delusions and deceptions that he's perpetrating out there. Friends, 90% truth is still 100% error. And I've seen some videos on the internet that are like 10% truth. So friends, we have to be very careful. Let us re-examine the six steps. Let's review the six steps before we begin our study. And I'm going to reverse the order that I gave previously so that because step number six is really the most important step. But let's look at that. Always pray first and ask God for wisdom before we open his word. Step two, ask for the Holy Spirit, John, 6, John 14, 26. We have to ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, but we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So that's the key there. Uh, step number three, Psalms 25, 9 humble ourselves and become teachable and coachable, just like a child. We must be willing to be taught of God and open to be taught of God. Step number four, Isaiah 28, 10, allow the Bible to interpret itself. This is where many Christians fall off the rails because they try to interpret the Bible instead of patiently searching the scriptures diligently uh, to find the answer. So what does this mean? It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What does this all mean? Well, the Bible gives us clues in order for us to arrive at the truth, but there's a caveat there. You must be willing to search for them. And sometimes what may appear to be the most obvious answer in the Bible is actually the wrong one. Let me give you an example of what that's like. I was speaking recently to an Adventist friend about this on the phone. Uh, he previously worked as a sergeant in a police department that was located in the Midwest. And he investigated fraud cases and he told me that he really liked doing that type of work. Um, he told me about an investigation that he did on someone recently because uh, the person was trying to defraud him or his him and his wife. So he had to do, he told me about the investigation. The difficult part was that he didn't have a name or address to even work with because uh, the fraud was committed on the internet. And he had no idea what part of the country that this person was even located in or what part of the world. So he explained how he was able to track down this person he could have easily misidentify him, but he, to be able to discover his real identity by patiently examining every clue. And he said that if he even ignored one clue, he could have very easily misidentified the person because the person was using a variety of different aliases and addresses. And it took him many days on his own, but his patience and persistence uh, finally paid off with a positive identification and of course, he gave the file down to the local police department there. But this is the kind of same kind of patience and persistence that we all need to have when we examine the scriptures or the evidence or clues that the Bible gives us. And sometimes the, the evidence in the scriptures is impossible to miss. But at other times, we have to search diligently for the evidence and then compare scripture 
to Scripture in order to arrive at the truth. So that is that in a nutshell. Let's go to step number five. It's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. We must have a love for the truth. We must have a willingness of heart to obey the truth once the truth is revealed to us. If we have a love for our own opinion instead of the truth, we're going to be easily deceived. And step number six, we must study to rightly divide the word of truth. So we have to compare what we've been taught in the scripture to what we've been taught to the scriptures to see if it actually agrees rather than the other way around. Some people want to see if what the scripture says agrees with what they've been taught. What we need to make sure to leave our preconceived ideas and opinions at the door. And then we have to open our hearts and minds to a thus saith the Lord. So let's start our study by examining the word angel, which is a name and a title. The word angel in Strong's Concordance means messenger of God. And it, is, it means as in messenger from God. So we must remember that the Bible uses dual application or symbols for many different Bible terms. So for example, as you can see here, church is woman in Jeremiah 6, 2. Waters is represented by peoples or multitudes, Revelation 17, 15. And beast is represented as a kingdom in Daniel 7, 23. This is very important for us to remember that because the Bible uses a lot of symbolic uh, names in, uh, in the Bible. So, for example, the Bible also uses many different names and symbols to reveal the character of Christ. And each name is used to reveal yet another facet of his character. So, for example, Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5. 5. The true vine, John 15, 1. Lamb of God, John 1, 29. I am, Exodus 3, 14. Son of man, John 1, 51. Son of God, Luke 1, 35. Emmanuel, Matthew 1, 23. Son of righteousness, Malachi 4, 2. The prince of peace, Isaiah 9, 6. High priest, high, Hebrews 5, 10. The word, John 1, 1. And the son of David, Mark 10, 47, 48, an advocate, 1 John 2, 1. This is just an example, and this is not all the terms that is used to describe Christ. Most Christians will have no problem identifying Christ from these names or titles that I just gave you. But despite all these symbolic comparisons, and there's many more given in Scripture, some of these Christians still believe that the Bible would never dare compare Christ to an exalted angel. This, my friends, is a false premise. We're going to show you from Scripture that the Bible does compare Christ to an exalted angel and many other comparisons and symbol symbolism in the Bible. So, a wise man once said, if your premise is faulty, your conclusion will be faulty also. And so we want to come to the right conclusion so we need to examine this premise because there are many people that have been taught this, but it's definitely not correct. If you've ever been taught something and then you research later to find out that what you've been taught was incorrect, and this is what we want to do here today. When most Christians think of angels, they think of heavenly beings called cherubim and seraphims. So let's examine that. Turn to your first text, Genesis 3.24. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. And I'm going to read here. He said, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, let's turn over to Isaiah. We're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures today. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2. And say amen when you have it. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. 
and with twain he did fly. So now we see here that cherubims and seraphims are commonly called angels in scripture. But we want to make a distinction here because the Bible also uses the word angel, which means messenger to symbolize other beings in scripture. And we want to show that to you shortly. So, but so that we can make this point less confusing, we're going to use the term cherubim to describe either one of these two heavenly beings, even though they're seraphims in Isaiah 6 too. But let us now look at three different characteristics of cherubim, which are called angels that nearly all Christians agree with. So let's look at characteristic number one. It says cherubim and seraphim are created beings. Most Christians won't argue that point. Let's look at number two. Cherubim cannot create life or give eternal life. That's number two. And number three, cherubim cannot be worshiped as God. Most Christians will always agree with these three points here. And it's very important to remember these three characteristics because they are very important clues that we're going to be looking at in the Bible to be able to properly identify if the Bible is talking about a cherubim or a seraphim or another being. So let's look at some Bible texts to confirm this. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're going to read verse 14 and 15. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14 and 15. And if you're there, you can read along with me. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And notice verse 15. It says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast what? Created. Created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, friends, who was the covering cherub that was created? It's none other than Lucifer, known as Satan, as found in Isaiah 14. Remember that because there's people that are promoting that Lucifer is a god. But it says here in the Bible that he was created. That's our first clue. And remember, there's nothing in Scripture that tells of a higher or more honored angel or cherub than Lucifer when he was the covering cherub. There is no other scripture in the Bible that says there was another angel higher than Lucifer at that time. So Lucifer is not a god, but he's a created cherub, cherubim. So let us now ask ourselves, who created all things? Turn in the Bible to Colossians, and we're going to read Colossians 1, verse 14 to 17. Colossians 1, verse 14 to 17. And say amen when you're there. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were some things, all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, notice that word all, were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. So can an angel create? No. John 1, 3 says all things were made by him and without him was not anything that was made. He was the word. Who is this talking about here? Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 3.9. Ephesians 3.9. And if you're there, say amen. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created how many things? By who? By Jesus Christ. So friends, as these Bible texts clearly state, Jesus Christ created all things with the Father, and all things were created by him and for him. So we can see that cherubim are created beings, 
and we're not involved in creation in any way. So what about worship? Can cherubim receive worship as God? No, they cannot. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 22, 8 and 9. Revelation 22, 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I did what? I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. And notice what happens next. In verse 9, it says, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this God, worship of this book, worship God. So this text shows us that cherubim cannot receive worship, friends. Only God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, can receive our worship. Uh, no other being can receive worship. This is a very important clue to keep in mind. What does it say here? It says, we may not worship angels. We are forbidden by example. That's found in Isaiah 6, 1 to 4, Revelation 4, 6 to 11, and Revelation 5, 8 to 14. Number two, we are forbidden by command. Exodus 20, 1 to 6, Colossians 2, 18. And number three, we are forbidden by angels themselves. And I just read one of the texts where the angel was forbidding John to worship him. So keep these very important characteristics in mind as we move forward. Now, question, is the word angel ever used to describe a being in scripture other than a cherubim or seraphim? The answer to that question is a resounding yes. The Bible gives us clues that it's going to lead us to the truth. So we have to carefully examine all the evidence or we'll miss this clue. We have to compare scripture with scripture. So let's now turn to Exodus chapter 23 and we're going to read verse 21, uh, verse 20 and 21. Exodus 23, 20 and 21. And remember the word angel means messenger of God. So let's look at this. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not do what? Pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now notice we have another clue in verse 21 here. Transgression means sin. Who alone in the Bible can pardon our sins? Can an angel, a cherubim or seraphim pardon our sins? A cherubim or seraphim cannot pardon our sins. And let's verify that. Let's look at Isaiah 55, 7. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 55, 7. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will do what? Abundantly pardon. Who's, who's this here? This is Jesus Christ. And as we can read in Luke 5, 20 and 21, that only God can forgive sins. So a man cannot forgive sins, right? An angel cannot forgive sins. Only Christ can forgive sins because he is of God. Well, the Pharisees were taking issue with Christ. Why were they saying he committed blasphemy? They were saying, who can forgive sins but God only? And they accused him of blasphemy. But he was Christ, so he could forgive sin. But for anyone less than God to forgive sins is blasphemy. So we see another clue here that the, this is being as described in Exodus 23, 20 and 21. is not a cherubim. It's not a seraphim because they cannot pardon our sins, but rather Christ himself. And notice the words, my name is in him. So let's look at that. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek 
my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will do what? Forgive their sin and will heal their land. Who's talking here? This is the Lord talking here. He says, friends, there is no doubt that the character of this being represented as an angel is a messenger of God and is Jesus Christ himself. But we're going to look at more evidence on this. Let us now turn to the Bible. Let us turn to, in, in the Bible, Exodus 14, and we're going to read verse 18 and 19. Exodus 14, 18 and 19. And say amen when you're there. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. Now, was this angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, and removed and went behind them. Who was this angel? Let's identify him. Let's turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And let's read verse 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and verse 4, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Jesus. Christ. So notice here that Paul equates the cloud, he equates the manna and the water from the rock, as well as the rock itself with Christ. So let us examine more clues. Now something else is interesting here. The Apostle Paul, who met Peter after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and he wrote much of the New Testament, um, he never once in all his writings said Peter was the rock, did he? Why not? Because he obviously knew that Christ was the rock and not Peter. So let's now, and he met Peter more than once. So let's now turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 9. We're going to be looking at clues and we're going to be building line upon line, precept upon precept. So let's look at Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he did what? Redeemed. He redeemed them and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Now, let us drop down to verse 12. That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself what? An everlasting name. So who is the angel of his presence and who is the Redeemer who could make himself an everlasting name? Is it a cherubim or seraphim? No. Only God and his son, Jesus Christ. No cherubim, no seraphim can ever save us or redeem us. Let us continue to look at more clues. Let's turn in our Bible to Zechariah 3, and we're going to read verse 1 to 4. Remember, we're building on clues. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And say amen when you're there. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, what does he say next? The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angels, and the filthy garments represent sin. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, 
and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Let's ask a question. What is iniquity? Sin. It's sin. Now, friends, notice something here about this angel of the Lord. The angel commanded the removal of Joshua's filthy garments and caused his iniquity to be canceled. Angels do not have the power to absolve sin. Only God can remove sin. So was this a cherubim or a seraphim, or was this a messenger of God, Jesus Christ? Only Christ. Let's look at that. Isaiah 44, 22. Let's see who has the power to cause his iniquity to be canceled to absolve sin. Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Who is this? Jesus Christ. No cherubim or seraphim can ever blot out our sins and redeem us. The angel that declared, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee is none other than Christ himself. And I can include several other examples in the Bible, but I believe you see the point. You must identify the behavior and the characteristics. You can't just go by the name because the Bible applies the word angel not only to seraphim and cherubims, but it applies it to other beings in the Bible. And there are times in Scripture when the word angel or angel of the Lord is used to de denote deity. How do you know the difference? You know when you examine the Scriptures to see what this person is able to do to examine who they're talking about. You must carefully examine the characteristics of the name angel to see who it is referring to. So you cannot simply make an assumption based on a name or you're going to be misled. And some time ago, you know, I was trying to locate a doctor that had treated me and I couldn't find their phone number. So what I did is I went on the internet and put their title in with their first and last name. And I was surprised at how many doctors came up with the same exact first and last name. So obviously, what did I do? I had to research to look at the characteristics about them in order to correctly identify who my doctor was. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the Bible will use many different names and many different titles to describe the character of Christ. And we're going to look at a name that is mentioned 15 times in the Bible. And 10 of these texts are simply just people that have the same name. But there's five of these Bible texts that reference a, the same heavenly being. And we want to clearly identify who this being is by examining the characteristics and examining the clues that are given in the Bible. And the name of this heavenly being is called Michael. So let's look at the very first clue, Michael the Almighty. Michael in the Strong's Concordance says, who is like God? Strong's Concordance in the Hebrew translation and derivative says the Almighty, but used also of any deity end quote. That is a quote. So let's understand that now that's our very first clue that we're looking at to establish who this person is, as in God with a capital G. So the Hebrew name of Michael found in the Old Testament, it means who is like God and its derivative. It means the almighty or mighty one, and it's used also of any deity. So let's examine more clues now. Let us look at the first three references to Michael, the prince and archangel in the book of Daniel. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel 10, 13. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Daniel 10, 13, I'm going to read this in your hearing. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, I want you to notice something here. I recently heard a man on YouTube claiming that this verse meant that Michael was only one of many princes. However, upon closer examination, we're going to see that the word one comes from the Hebrew word in this particular text called Eshad and is frequently translated as first or greatest or highest of the chief princes came to help me. So this changes the whole meaning of this text.
But let's not just rest it all on this one text because we're going to look at all the different texts to come to the right conclusion. So let's continue to examine all the evidence from Scripture as we look at the very next text. And let's drop down and now and read verse 21 for our next clue. Verse 21 of Daniel 10. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Here's another clue. Notice here that Michael is called your prince. So the obvious question is who's Daniel's prince? Let's get the answer from the Bible. Let's go to Daniel 9.25, and we're going to find out who Daniel's prince is. Daniel 9.25 says, Therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto who? Messiah. The Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Who does the Bible say is the Messiah? It doesn't apply it to any cherubim or seraphim, does it? The Messiah is Jesus Christ. And this is part of the 70-week prophecy. And the Messiah, the prince, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. This is Daniel's prince. It was Jesus Christ that caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease in AD 31 in verse 27. And Messiah means anointed. And there can be no doubt that Daniel's prince is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But let's continue to examine more evidence. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel 12.1. Daniel 12.1. Because in order to establish the identity, we have to keep building the evidence, one clue after another. And Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, I want you to notice some clues in this text that we just read. Michael now is called the great prince. Did you catch that? Who is the prince of peace? Jesus Christ. Is there a greater prince than Jesus? No. no. Let's look at Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9.6. I'm going to keep establishing the identities. Isaiah 9.6. Say amen when you have that. Amen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be called, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and who? The Prince. the Prince of Peace. So there's no prince greater than Jesus Christ. Now, friends, there is not. But notice, what is Michael doing in this text? Let's see what he's doing. It says, he stands up, and it says, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So let us now examine what this means. What does an earthly judge do uh, usually do when he pronounces a verdict or a sense or a judgment after he strikes the gavel. What does he usually do? He stands up, right? So notice in the verse that Michael standing up commences with the great time of trouble. It's right there in the text. And such as never was since there was a nation. So this means that judgment is pronounced. Now let's prove this. What event in scripture caused Israel to close their probation as a nation? It was the stoning of Stephen, right? And I want you to know something. What was Jesus doing at that time? Turn in your Bibles now to Acts 7. Let's build on this. Acts 7. And we're going to read verses 55 and 56. Acts 7, 55 and 56. And say amen when you're there. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man doing what? Standing. standing on the right hand of God. So Stephen here saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This means that judgment was pronounced, the verdict was given, and the sentence was handed out. Israel had closed their probation as a nation. 
Now, they can still be saved individually, but as a nation, they close their probation. And notice how Paul and Barnabas confirm this. Turn over to Acts 13, 46. Acts 13, 46. And in speaking to the Jews here, Paul and Barnabas, they said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So that's very clear of what happened with the stoning of Stephen. Now, friends, let's ask this question. Who is the judge of all the world? Jesus Christ. Let's verify that. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 4.1. 2 Timothy 4.1. We want to be able to keep looking up these scriptures to build these precepts. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And notice one more thing in Daniel 12.1 that Michael does. He standeth for the children of thy people. This means that he intercedes, he defends, and he stands as our substitute. Who only can intercede on our behalf? A seraphim and cherubim cannot intercede for us, friends. They cannot intercede for our behalf. So only Jesus Christ, he is our only mediator from Scripture. Remember our Scripture text from earlier? Only Jesus Christ can intercede. But now let's look at more evidence. Let us turn to Jude 1.9 in the New Testament. Jude chapter 1 and verse 9. And when you have it, say amen. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said what? Now, this text confuses some people. It has some very big clues in this particular text as to the real identity of Michael. In the previous text, Michael is referred to as the great prince, your prince, one or first of the chief princes. But here now he's referred to as the archangel. And arch in Greek means archo, which means chief or principal or greatest. And we know that angel means messenger. So it simply means chief or greatest messenger who is God. But let's confirm this. Let us look at some additional clues in this text to confirm Michael's true identity. First, let us look again at a text that we read earlier in Zechariah 3, 2. And it's up there on the screen if you can see it. Uh, I'll read it to you. And it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now notice this. We all know it's the Lord right here, right? But let me ask you a question. Do you notice any similarities between this text and Jude 9? Yes or no? The Lord was contending with Satan in Zechariah 3, 1. And in verse 2, it says, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. And notice that Satan is again rebuked in Jude 9 by Michael. Now, recently, someone was attempting to say that Michael and the Lord were two different people in Jude 9. But I want you to notice something that some people miss in this text. And in Zechariah 3, 2, Christ is speaking in the second person when he says, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Is he not? He's speaking of himself in the second person. If he were speaking in the first person, he would say, it would be normal for Christ to say, I rebuke thee, O Satan. But instead, he says, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, most people that talk, we speak in the first person. So, when they talk about themselves. So they would normally say something like this, I'm going to church or I'm driving home, right? Now, since we have three Allens in this church, I'm gonna use the name Allen as an example. So uh, if Allen, if one of the Allens is speaking about himself, would he say Allen is going to church or Allen is, going, is driving home? Or would he be saying, I am going to church or I am driving home? Obviously, he would say, I'm going to church and I'm driving home. So if he said, Alan is going to church 
and Alan is driving home, then he's speaking in the second person, and this would be a very, very unusual way for anyone to, to refer to themselves, right? However, this is not an unusual way for Christ to refer to himself. Let's prove that. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 8, 20. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20. In fact, I have it here on the screen, so I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds in the, of the air have nests, but what? Hath not where to lay his head. Is Christ here speaking in the first person or second person? He's speaking in the second person. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 4, 7. We're going to see if this is a normal way for Christ to speak. Matthew 4, 7. Now notice this again. Matthew 4, 7. And, he, and Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Is he speaking in the first person or second person? He's speaking in the second person, right? It says, now, and I'm going to read this. It says, and he saith unto him, here's another example, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his, his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And you could see again, he says, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He's speaking of himself in the second person, not in the first person. And if you go through the scriptures, you see that Christ is talking to Satan, and he's always referring to himself in the second person. And those of you that are great mathematicians, you can challenge me, take this up, take this challenge up, and, and look up every text that you find where Jesus refers to himself in the second person, and look up every text that you find where he refers to himself in the first person, and you add it up and see what you find out. And you're going to find out what many of us have already know, that this is a very, very common way for Christ to speak of himself in the second person. Jude 9 is just simply another example of Christ talking about himself in the second person. So, But there's one more clue given here in Jude 9. Do you remember the three characteristics of a cherubim and seraphim that we talked about? As created beings, they cannot create life, Right? They cannot give life. So who then is resurrecting Modem, Moses? Is it a cherubim or seraphim that's resurrecting him? Who only can give the gift of eternal life? Jesus. None other than Jesus Christ. No created being can resurrect anyone to eternal life. No man or angel, only Christ, only God. So who is the resurrection and the life? Turn to John eleven twenty five. 25. John eleven twenty five, and some of us know this text by heart. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection of the life and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. Notice what he doesn't say. He says, me and some angels that I appointed. He says, I am the resurrection of the life. So beloved, only the great I am can resurrect us to eternal life. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And it's up on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with what? The voice, the voice of the archangel. Pay attention to that. And with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice that word voice. Let's examine this closely. The Lord that shouts with the voice of the archangel is one and the same person. How do we know this for sure? Let's prove this from the scriptures. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. I want everybody to turn to this text. John chapter 5 verse 25 to 29 because this scripture puts a capstone with an explanation point on it and I don't want anyone here to miss this point. I'm even going to put this text up on the screen so I don't want you to miss this text here. Now notice this. What does it say? It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the what? Voice. 
voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall do what? For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he hath given him authority to do what? Execute judgment also because he is the what? Son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which, notice the word, all that are in the grave shall do what? Hear his voice. Hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So notice here, friends, the only voice the dead will hear is the voice of the Son of God. No cherubim or seraphim's voice can raise the dead. Only Christ can execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. It is the voice of God that will resurrect all the dead. So who's speaking here? Notice in verse 19 that this is Christ. And did you notice that is Christ talking in the first person or second person? He's talking in the second person about himself. Those that come to you that are claiming that some other created being is raising the dead, they make God a liar because if in your Bibles, if you have a red letter Bible, this verse is in red. So this is Christ speaking here. Let's look at one more text for evidence. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 12, 7. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So notice here as you read further that the dragon is Satan. We're all clear on that. And he and his angels were cast out of heaven. Now you remember in Ezekiel that Satan, who was once Lucifer, was an anointed cherub at that time, and he was the covering cherub next to God's throne. So he was the, like the highest ranking angel at that time. So the Bible doesn't tell us of any other cherubim or seraphim that was ranked higher than Lucifer at that time. So would another cherubim or seraphim have the power and authority to cast Christ and his to cast Satan and his angels out of heaven? No. no. The answer is no. Only Christ, who's the commander of all the heavenly hosts, could cast Satan and his angels out of heaven. No created being could ever wield this type of power and authority, friends. Only God himself. And friends, we have proved beyond any doubt from the scriptures, beyond any doubt, that Michael is not a created being. Michael is not a cherubim. Michael is not a seraphim. Michael is not, there's no angels that were given special powers over other angels. No, friends. They may have higher ranks, but he doesn't have any other power that any other angel has that doesn't have. Michael is not a cherubim and he's not a seraphim, but the almighty God, Jesus Christ himself. There is some religion, there's a religion out there that teaches that Jesus was a man who became Michael. This is false. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is God. Jesus was not a man that became Michael. Michael is simply another word that describes the character of Christ. He is our only mediator. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the great I am. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the morning star. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. He is our high priest. He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's the Messiah. He's the true vine. He's the lamb of God. He's the son of righteousness. He's the only begotten son. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. He is Michael, the great prince, the archangel. He's the captain of the Lord's host. He's the rock. He's the bread of life. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. He is God's eternal son. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is God himself. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end from Genesis all the way down through Revelation. It's all about Jesus Christ, friends. And if you look in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see that Christ appears numerous times in the Old Testament. He just doesn't appear as his name. He appears as all these other beings in the Old Testament. It's all about Jesus Christ, friends. It's all about him. I'm going to close with this beautiful text in Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, 
and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Amen, amen and amen. Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that there are times that Satan is attacking us, trying to get us to reject the Son of God. But we know, Lord, that you shed your precious blood. You have covered us with your blood, and you were throughout all the scriptures. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you always. You walk by us. You are creator God. You are redeemer. You've given your life that we may have a chance at everlasting life. You are the life giver, Lord. Help us to be faithful so that someday soon we can also see your face when you come in the clouds of glory to take us home with you. I pray and ask a special blessing for each and every one here and those that are continuing to search the scriptures to find the truth of God's word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead them into all truth and righteousness. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.